all with us this morning. Praise God. Appreciate you being here. Eric's aunt, praise the Lord. Good to see you. Glad to have you with us. And uh, everyone out there on Facebook, welcome. We appreciate you being with us and, and joining in the service today via the internet. Praise the Lord. And that's, that's a good thing. This time, especially in these days. But uh, we appreciate everybody being a part of the service and uh, participating in however and whatever way you may like. Thank the Lord. And thanks all of the uh, members that are here for sharing your prayer requests, testimonies, and encouragement uh, to each of us. And that's always a good thing. Amen. To hear the Holy Spirit come together through the individuals. Amen. Because we are of like spirit. Hallelujah. And of course, I want to thank Tim for opening and doing a great job as always. Fantastic. Appreciate that so much. Mike and Suzanne for all that they're doing and continue to do. Suzanne's doing like triple duty today. And amen, that's good. Good for me anyway. Praise the Lord. Appreciate it. Happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. Amen. And uh, in whatever capacity that happened. Amen. Uh, it, for me, it's both ways. I've had, uh, we have nine children uh, between the two of us, Sally and I. Uh, she had four before we were married. I had four before we were married. And we have one together. So that's that's nine, and that makes about 26 grandchildren and about five or six great-grandchildren that I'm aware of, praise the Lord, at this point. But it's great, amen, and uh, you know, who knew? 40 years ago, over 40 years ago now that Sally and I got together that, uh, that we would end up in the situation that we're in today, which is blessed of God, and I can promise you that, amen. And there have been some ups and downs and some sideways, and most of those, in fact, I would say, they were all because of decisions I made, not because of anything God was doing in terms of the ups and downs. He has a pretty straight path for all of us if we can just find it and, and have the discipline to stay on it, praise the Lord. But the good news is when we deviate, he doesn't. He always brings us back and loves us as we do our own children and grandchildren. Amen. And uh, I like to think of me being a grandchild of God, although I know he has no grandchildren, but I understand from my own perspective being a grandfather is a lot more fun than being a father was. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Less stress. Praise the Lord. And, uh, you know, you can spoil them rotten and then they go home. Praise God. And that's kind of the way God does. He spoils us rotten and then he brings us home. So, praise God. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. Great to uh, uh, be experiencing Father's Day with all of you. And that's a good thing. Hallelujah. I was just thinking this morning. You know, I used to, I used to tend bar and I did some cooking and uh, different things, but I got to thinking about it. I was never very good at following instructions, and that's why I only spent one tour in the Marine Corps. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it said, I, 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 when I read a recipe, it's like reading science fiction. You know, when I get to the end of it, I think, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> I know it sounds good. It looks good, you know, until I get to mess with it, and then it becomes a nightmare. Amen. Yeah. So I'm thinking that doing a little traveling because, uh, you know, things are starting to open up a little bit. And uh, I'd love to visit Holland, wouldn't you? A practical Czech or Czechoslovakian is considered to be pragmatic. Prag. They're not going to get any better, so you might as well just, you know, <laughs> you know encourage me a little bit here. So I saw a documentary on shipbuilding last week. It was riveting. <laughs> and for you ladies who may not be married or thinking about dating, let me just give you a warning here. Never date a tennis player because love means nothing to them. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, I can see your ready to move on from here. I do appreciate all the testimonies and things you were sharing this morning because it's so what God has put on my heart. Look, we're in a time where faith is critical. Now, we've lived in times where faith, it always takes faith, but uh, we're living in a time now where you really have to put your faith out there. And in the past, we could kind of do some things on our own and maybe you work a little harder, get a second job. You know, lots of things you could do to kind of help the situation out a little bit without having to totally depend on uh, God. But that's not the case anymore. And I think that's the positive side of this because what God's going to do is bring a church out of this that will grow into the full stature of Jesus Christ. And I talked about this last week. I, I won't go back into all of that. But there's really only two kind of people on this planet. And that's 
saved and unsaved. It's either people who are believers or people who are not believers. And the problem will always be the clash between those, if you want to call it that, cultures. And so I think what Jesus is doing now, because within the church we know the body of Christ is as fragmented as the rest of the world is. And that's the saddest part about this. So what God, I think, is trying to do through all of this is to get us, and it has to start with us, right? I mean, it's going to start with me. I'm not going to uh, prejudge somebody because they are some other denomination. It, it makes no sense. We're either believers or we're not. It isn't all the other rituals and all the other stuff that we do within our belief system. It's just whether or not Jesus is Lord. And if He is, then I'm... You know, I'm the brother to the Catholic, I'm the brother to the Baptist, to the Pentecostal, to the Methodist, to who, I don't care what they call themselves. If they're a believer in Jesus, that's my brother. That's my sister, and I have to love them. Now, just like in any family, I come from a big family with six kids, and, and uh, you know, listen, we had dis differences. We used to have boxing matches in the basement when I was a kid growing up, and uh, that's kind of the way our dad let us work out our frustrations, you know, Make, put on the gloves so you don't leave scars, you know and don't use any sharp instruments, but basically, we had differences, we had issues, but we always loved each other. I mean, you can, you can not like what a brother or a sister does, but you can't stop loving them, that's family. It's just like a mother or a father with their children. You, this, we all have seen our kids do something we didn't think was very smart, or we didn't appreciate the way that they did it, or why they did it, or whatever. But it never changed how we feel about them, that we love them, and we just love them through that situation and figure, hey, they'll grow up, they're going to mature, they'll learn to deal with situations the same as we have. So, praise the Lord. That's, I think the body of Christ, which is the believers, has to come together. I said last week, there has to be an appearing of Jesus in his body on this earth before he returns. So that's where we're at. I think that's where God's bringing us to this place where we can begin to love one another, the brethren, first. Because if we don't love each other, nobody's going to believe in our love outside of the church. And I think that's where a lot of this uh, fractiousness is taking place is they don't have respect for the church because the church doesn't seem to have respect for itself, for one another. So God's got the plan, amen. We just have to be faithful to it. And if we'll love the way he loves us and just be willing to give grace to those that are around us, I think we can see dramatic changes. In fact, I know that we will. I think we're living in a time where we're going to see some of the most dramatic moves of God that have ever taken place on this earth. So with that in mind, I want to go this morning to just let's focus on, on God, on faith in God and what what real faith is not, we, you know, we've, we've built it up into all sorts of things, confessions and so forth. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's all true. But the bottom line is we either believe what God has said or we don't. And if we believe it, then we have to stand on it as it was, has already been said, whether we're feeling it, whether we're seeing it or not. If you're seeing it and you're feeling it, that's not faith. That's just experiencing a, a reality that's taking place. The truth is... This is the reality, amen, and the only reality, amen, that this world is ever going to really know. Now, they can make up their own stuff as they go along, which they've been doing for centuries, but it doesn't change the Word of God. The Word of God will come to pass. As long as there's somebody out there that will believe it, as long as there's somebody out there that will agree with it, it's going to happen, amen. And so I think we're at the place now where, to use an old cliche, where the rubber meets the road, where we're going to really have to prove Whose side are we on? Who do we really believe? Amen? And God didn't create the situation, but it will bring glory to God when it happens, when we do what only faith can do, and that's trust God in spite of all the other stuff that's going on around us. Amen? So with that in mind, let's begin with, uh, I want to start with 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I'm going to use some scriptures. We're all familiar with these, but I want us to look at them in the context of this is what we have to do. This is what, this is our part in revealing God to, an earth, to a world who doubts everything. Yeah. And certainly they doubt God. Somebody has to be there to believe for this in order for them to have a, a chance, amen, to receive Him themselves, amen. So all Scripture <clears throat> is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, or for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All right? And then let's uh, look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 1, <clears throat> 1 through 4. Praise the Lord. God, who at sundry times 
and in divers' manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the, power of his, uh, by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And then we'll go to Mark chapter 11 and verse 22. Mark 11, 22. And Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. Bottom line, have faith in God. Now let me just say this. Um, Jesus is God in the flesh. He and the Father were one. They are one. They were one before his birth here on earth, before his physical coming. We see him in different uh, manifestations in the Old Testament. But everything is pointing to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is God coming to us, and rather than us going to God. Right? All through the Old Testament, it was people going to God. Now, God would reach out to people through the prophets and so forth. But God's ultimate purpose was He would come and be with us. Amen? So, Jesus is that reality. So, there is no deviation between Jesus and God. They are the same. Right? It's just that God is a spirit and nobody's seen Him. So he comes in flesh in the person of Jesus. He goes back to the Father, he says, he himself, and I'll send you the Spirit. Right? So we have Jesus, or we have the Holy Spirit, or God's Spirit, dwelling in us. It's, not, it's almost like it's semantics, you know, I mean, it gets confusing. But the truth is, the simplest way to look at this is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Now, I'm not denying the manifestation of three entities here, but I'm talking about it's one God. Yes. And it always has been one God, and it always will be one God. So when we talk about these scriptures that I'm going to share with you this morning, think in those terms, because that makes it a lot easier kind of to deal with, right? A little, a little easier to understand, I hope. So God's Word is final. That's what we're, that's what we're coming to. I mean, that's what we've read here in the, just in these three uh, pieces of scripture, but it's throughout the entire Bible. Amen. God's word is true. His word is final. His word is understandable. His word is necessary. And his word is enough. Yes. Praise the Lord. If we never see another vision, if we never have another dream, if we never have another, uh, you know, prophetic word, we have everything we need right here. Now, I'm not saying the other things don't happen and won't happen. I'm just saying if they don't. That isn't what I'm, I'm not basing my belief in God on somebody's vision or on some prophetic word that comes from somebody. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying here is how I know the truth. It isn't what somebody else says. It's what God has said. Now, if they're saying what God says, then hallelujah, I'm, all on, I'm on board. You know, I'm with them. But that's how he says to search the scriptures and see if it's God, right? So scripture makes us competent. Amen? In fact, uh, it, we just read, it, it equips us for every, it says good work, but only God is good. So it's saying for every God work, this scripture is, has made it possible for us to do whatever God has said. Amen. Amen? So the big idea in the first verses of Hebrew is this, is actually the big idea for the whole book of Hebrews. And in fact, is the whole idea for the book of the Bible, the entire Bible. Amen? So God has spoken, he says, by his son. And his son is superior to everyone, heavenly, humanly, amen, uh, institutions. He's bigger than rituals. He's bigger than any previous revelation that's been. And in fact, every revelation that ever has been, has been about Jesus, whether we understood that to be the fact or not. And every revelation that comes to us now is about Jesus, and it's only a revelation to us. It's not new to God. It's a new thing to the individual who gets that revelation. You hear somebody will say, well, I have a revelation of this, and you're thinking, well, I, I mean, I've been knowing that for a long time. Well, it doesn't make it a, not a revelation for them. It just means that it's, it already existed. It existed before I understood it. It existed before you did or anybody else did. Amen. It's just the truth. 
And you know how how many uh, y'all you know more than 30 years old have understood that uh, there's a lot of truth out there that I thought was truth that I found out later wasn't truth. Right? I got a revelation. <laughs> you know. So that's that's all I'm really saying. Uh, that's that's what verses one and two begin with in in Hebrews uh, chapter one. It begins with actually a series of contrasts. And when you read it, when I, I remember reading this years ago and thinking, man, it's just, it's, it, it, it doesn't make sense. It's like, like they're talking two different languages here. But the first of these controversies, or these contrasts, I should say, is the word eras, which is time past, or when the Bible says long ago, ages past, right? But now we are in these days. He says, there was a time when I dealt like this, but now in these last days, or in this eras, amen, God who at sundry times and divers man spake in time past unto the prophets and the fathers, right? So that doesn't necessarily mean that the end of the world is coming, although I believe it's closer than it's ever been. What it means is we have entered into a new age, amen, the age of the spirit or the fullness of time. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. Now this is Paul talking about the age that we have entered into or this age of the spirit. It's the same age that we're in. So we know that it is the last days. It was the last days then so obviously it's the last days now. So when the fullness of time was come God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you're sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying Abba Father. Amen. So the death and the resurrection of Jesus ushered the world into a whole new time or an epoch. Amen. And there's no act of redemption left to take place. Amen. There's no more redeeming to be done until the last day arrives. Amen. And that puts us in the last days. I'm not saying people won't be saved. I'm just saying all the redemptive acts that needed to be done are done. There's no more coming. There isn't going to... That's why he says, if you don't believe in Jesus, there is therefore now no more salvation for you, right? Because you can't go back to Judaism. You can't go back to some other thing because Jesus is the answer. So you either trust in Him or you're out of luck. That's just the bottom line. Amen? And so it means we've got ourselves into a new age. Amen? And there's no act of redemption left to be accomplished. And so that puts us in the last days, right? Okay, so that the second contrast here is recipients. Who, who receives this? In the earlier time, he says that long ago, God spoke to our fathers and the patriarchs, right? To the Jewish ancestors. But in these days, in these last days, amen, God has spoken to us. He's not speaking through them or to them anymore. He's speaking to us directly, amen? This is a different age. Amen? God is speaking to a different group of people. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not anti-Jewish by any means. Jesus was a Jew. I'm just saying God shifted to the Gentiles when the Spirit was given. So, if Jews are still being saved, obviously, but only because they come to Christ, not because God is giving them separate information or some other language or something. He's speaking to believers. By the Spirit. And that's the way He's working in these last days. Amen? And so, a different group. Now, the third contrast here is the agents. The means by which He speaks, right? So, God has also spoken by a different agency. Amen? In times past, He spoke by the prophets. Whether they were named prophets like Moses or Isaiah. Or just the prophetic writings, amen, of the Old Testament. That's how He spoke. Amen? But in these last days... God has spoken by His Son. Praise the Lord. Jesus Christ has revealed what God is like. He's taught us the will of God. He's shown us the way of God. He's given us salvation that can only come from God. Amen? And so the fourth contrast then are the ways in which He does it. Long ago, God spoke at, or says spoke many times, or the word is polymeros, amen, and in many ways, polytropos, which is the, the, the means of different ways of saying it, amen, but in these last days, God has spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is one means of revelation. Praise the Lord. Only one. And that's His Son. That's Jesus Christ. 
All four of these contrasts are meant to lead us to the same conclusion. And it's spelled out in Hebrews 1, verses 2 through 4. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had laid, had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. In fact, he has a name that's above every name. It's a name above, we used to have a, a, a deal up there similar to this, only it had all the names of God, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sidkinu, Jehovah Shalom, all... He has a name that's above all of God's names that have been known in the past. Either that or this isn't true. Praise the Lord. So, in these last days, God is speaking to us by His Son or by His manifest presence in the earth. Amen. And all of these contrasts are to, supposed to lead us to the same conclusion. Amen. That everything ends in Christ. Amen. Could you go back to verse 2 there? Everything ends in Jesus. Remember, even Jesus said, I in you, you in me, we in God. Amen. And when everything wraps up, what happens? We're all back in God. Praise the Lord. God, so hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. That's how God is talking today. That's how God is speaking to us. Amen. This age, and if you think about it, this age is about bringing Christ what rightfully belongs to Him. Amen. By His body in this earth. Amen. The Son, let's think of this. The Son is the creator of all things. He is the sustainer of all things. He made purification for our sins. He is the revelation of God. He sat down. He became superior to angels, to every other heavenly being. Amen. And that's why we have the fullness and the finality of God's redemptive revelation. There isn't any more to be done for people to be saved. Praise the Lord. And so everything in the long ago days pointed to Christ. And everything was completed in Christ. The, uh, the, the predictions, the prophecies, the, the, the types, the shadows, everything is about Jesus. Amen. And that's the fullness part of this equation. Praise the Lord. It's fulfilled in Christ. Everything is fulfilled in Him. So just as important is the finality of what Christ did or the works of Christ. That it's done. Right? And so salvation, which literally translates sozo, which means wholeness, healing, prosperity, deliverance. All, salvation brought all of that to us. It wasn't just an escape from hell. It brought every benefit of God, every bit of inheritance. Whatever is His is ours, praise the Lord. And so we can't separate redemption from revelation. Amen? Both were finished and fulfilled in Christ. There's no new revelation. Now we get, like I said earlier, we get what seems to be new revelation to us. It's not new. It was there all along in Christ. We just didn't see it. How many of you, when you first got born again or first came to know the Lord, you thought in terms of uh, a much simpler way. Jesus is saving me from hell. I won't go to hell. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. That's the prayer my mother used to pray with us kids before we'd go to bed at night. That was my understanding. If I die, I'm going to heaven. I didn't understand anything else about it. I didn't know doctrine or theology or anything else. And that's the simplest way to understand God. But the truth is, there is so much more to God. And the more we seek God or the more we look for God, the more we find Him, the more revelation we have. It isn't new things that God's doing. It's just new things that we're understanding that God has made available to us. I mean, I went to church for years. I didn't know God would heal. I didn't know that God would speak to me personally. I thought I had to go to Sunday and get a message about the, whatever happened in the news that week. Because that's the way it was where, where I went to church. They didn't have a salvation message. So little by little, I'd go to a different church as I got a little older or here or there. Or I'd meet other people and they'd share things. And i come to find out God's done a whole lot more than what I thought he'd done. And I'm finding that out still today. God is still doing things, although he's already done it. If that makes sense, I'm, try I, I, I'm trying to not lose you here. But we can't separate redemption from revelation because both were finished and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God versus, you could say it like this, the Word of God, Jesus, versus the Word of God. Right? My understanding of Jesus 
versus the truth of God's word. That's why we have all these denominations, because there's a con contradiction here, amen, between this is Jesus. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't separate him from this. You can't have your own Jesus and have him not fit this description, this reality here, amen? And so the Bible, how about the Bible versus Jesus? They're the same. I've heard, I've heard people argue this, secular uh, people generally, but even some uh, so-called Christians argue whether Jesus was different than this. There's a movie out now about Jesus being gay or being uh, a, a, maybe a female uh, impersonator. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. No, no. All you have to do is read the Bible, you moron, and you'll find... I'm sorry about that. That's not nice. But I'm just saying, read the Bible. There's, there's nothing in there vaguely referring to anything like that. This is the imagination of some demonically inspired idiot that just hates Christians, hates God, hates Jesus, because they don't know, and they just want to be idiots and act foolish. Amen? And so, how about the words of the Bible... And the word made flesh are distinct, but they're also inseparable. Yes, Jesus was a man, but he was a physical manifestation of the word of God. Yes. Amen. I know it's a, there's a distinct difference, but they're not separate. You can't separate the two. You can't separate Jesus from this anymore. You can separate, if you have that mindset, God from this. Because they're all the same. They're all one. Amen. And so the words of the Bible and the word made flesh are distinct. Look at John 14. Verse 26. And I'm going this long way about this because simply the bottom line is this is the truth. And if, anything, if it doesn't agree with this, it's false. It's either an intentional lie or it's just someone operating in ignorance that just doesn't know. Amen. I can stand up here all day long and tell you that 2 plus, uh, to use Tim's analogy, 2 plus 4 is 8. And... I suppose if I get enough people on my side and so a few academics, we could change the math books the same way we, they changed uh, English and, and uh, the, you know, the old phonics and ways of teaching. And now you've got kids that can't even read. They're in high school and they still can't read. Uh, anyway, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. So he's, the Holy Spirit isn't coming to tell us something new. The Holy Spirit comes to echo or to tell us or remind us what Jesus has already said, what has already been declared, right? All right, look at John 16, verses 13 through 15. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For... How, how will he guide you into all truth? He's not going to talk about himself as if he was, had something different to say. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. He's just going to show you. The Holy Spirit is simply going to show you Jesus. He's just going to reveal God to you. In, in, in ways maybe that you haven't understood before. I mean, the Holy Spirit does lead us and give us revelation, but it's not unique to the Holy Spirit. It's coming from Jesus or from God. It's one thing. Yes. Amen? And it has settled. It's established. We just don't know all of it. And so the Holy Spirit quickens things to us that we've read in here. I mean, we all know this. We've read things. we read scriptures over and over and over. And then all of a sudden, one day we read it and go, oh, my God. Never saw that. That's the Holy Spirit quickening something that Jesus had said, already said long ago. It isn't a new thing. It's just new to our understanding because we didn't have the revelation of it as it was given. Amen. So think of it, just for example, think of the three offices of Christ. He was a prophet, a priest, and a king. Amen. And in every real sense, Christ has finished his work in each of those three. It's done. He's finished. It's, there's nothing else has to be done. Amen. And so look at this. Uh, but yet, here, here the weird part of this is, he continues to work through that finished work in us. Through us. Now, I know that sounds kind of wonky. It doesn't make natural sense. But the truth is, it's finished. 
because it's done. It was done before the foundation of the world. It's just a question of now who's going to believe it, who's going to have revelation of this, and then act on it. So it, it gets kind of redone. Amen? That's what we're here for. That's, that's why we're here. Praise the Lord, because people have come since Christ. Amen? And so we're here for that. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, quickly. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Now, if that doesn't give you a headache, if you really are trying to read that, make sense out of it. But it's exactly what I just said. It's done. But it's a question on who's going to believe that it's done. They see, they see it done. They see it finished. The people who don't believe it, they're, they're trying to figure out what we're talking about. Right? But... He has done everything. Everything that needs to be done is done. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world. I mean, it's crazy. But we have to still receive Him. So, we are, we are joint heirs with Christ, right? We are kings. He's declared that we're kings. We are priests. And Paul said, I would that y'all prophesy. Y'all are prophets. Y'all have the ability to prophesy. That's all this is. You declare this to somebody, you're prophesying, and you're, you have a sound prophecy. And here's the deal. If you're, this is where the, the years ago we, we missed it so bad because prophets would come to churches, and we all sat under these things, and they'd, they'd dangle you over hell and scare people and try to get them to come to Jesus out of fear, and what's bad things going to happen. Listen, the, the, the New Testament Scripture, this is the Spirit. Now, where God wanted this to be all along, He says, any, any prophet that comes to you and he prophesies, if it's not edifying... If it's not building up, if it's not making you understand God in a clearer way uh, in, in His love for you, then it's a false prophet. That's a false prophecy. Any prophecy that comes by the Spirit of God is going to reveal God, the goodness of God, Him wanting to uplift you, Him wanting to encourage you, Him wanting to, to make you feel uh, comfortable and, and, and strong in the Lord. Amen? And so, as, as a king, but uh, here we go again. Here's what I'm saying. As a king, he's seated on the throne. So, it's done, right? He went back and seated at the right hand of the Father. He's on the throne. Position of power. Amen. Yet, there's still enemies to subdue under his feet. Now, what's that? He's a high priest. See, he, he, is, see, he is done. But there are still enemies on the earth. Demonic forces. And they are to be under his feet. Now, how's that going to happen? Only if we literally believe that we are the body of Christ. That we are the means by which this happens. It's already done in the mind of God because He knows the end from the beginning. The question is, have we got a revelation of this? And will we act on that? Will we become the revelation? Are, you see what I'm saying? Will we become the revelation of his, everything under His feet? Praise the Lord. As a priest, right? He fully paid for our sins through His sacrifice. Amen? And still, every, everybody's sins have been forgiven. But they still have to receive it. They still, it's done. But how many, it's not the will of God that any should perish. But there are literally billions of people that will perish and be without God. Not because God hasn't finished the work, but because they have not received it. Why have they not received it? Because we haven't shared it the way we should. As, as boldly, amen, and as generously, and as gracefully as we should. It's, it, that's what I mean. It's a contra it sounds contradictory, but the truth is, we are, as, as we've said before, we are a, a revelation of God in the earth. I know that sounds haughty or kind of arrogant, but that's what he said. We are his body. And that's what I mean by growing up into the full stature is when the church really begins to function in this finished work and the reality of what we already have, what is already done. Amen. And we, we've made people feel guilty because they didn't get their healing instantaneously. No. You believe. Even when you're not seeing it. Even when the doctor isn't agreeing with the Word of God. You're not feeling it. Amen. But there comes a point where you and Jesus come together. Amen. And healing happens. Sometimes it's instantaneous. Sometimes it's a process. 
but it's still done. That's where you have to stand because it's hard to get to that place if you aren't standing on what the Word of God says. If you're letting the circumstance or the feelings or the reports dictate to you. I'm not saying you don't feel it in your body because we all got feelings. We all have aches and pains and the older you get, the more you'll have. Amen. But you still have to believe that you're healed. You've got to stand on it, amen, until it happens. Until it manifests, period. Amen. And so, praise the Lord. Hebrews 2, verse 3. This is faith. Faith is, you know, we used to think it's come, get everybody together and have a, like a cheering thing, a cheerleader gathering or a, you know, ha, 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 we'll get everybody all excited and then you can just say, oh, praise the Lord. And I'm not against you know, worshiping and doing that. I'm just saying we had these things where it was just hyped up and get everybody freaked out and then they walk out the door and next week they're right back at the altar with the same problem, the same issues and everything else because it was only a, a, a moment of, of hyper activity and, and uh, kind of freaking out that caused them to think something happened that didn't happen. They just let their emotions go. Sometimes we need that. I mean, I'm not against it. I'm just saying that isn't necessarily a healing service. It's just people... Worshiping God and getting excited. People can get healed in those things. But that isn't, that isn't God's plan. God, that, that was for the unbeliever. If there's any sick among you, call for the elders of the church. Or call for the mature people who, are not, you know, who understand what this is all about. And they'll pray the prayer of faith. And God will forgive your sins and heal you. Because a lot of this stuff comes from guilt and shame. They're thinking that, well, I deserve this because I'm such a jerk or I've been such a bad person. You know, it's no wonder I've got this sickness or this disease or what have you. But how shall we escape? How, you know, here we are already saved. I mean, not saved, but you know what I'm saying. The redemptive work is finished. It's over. All we've got to do is receive it. But he says, how will we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So there's still a part to be played. He's done it, but we have to receive it. And it's true for everything. It's, it's fundamentally true for our own salvation. But out of that, what did I say salvation was? Sozo. So it, it includes your healing. It includes your prosperity. It includes your relationships. It includes everything that is part of our inheritance. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard it? That's our job now, is to confirm it, to affirm it. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So as a prophet, Jesus has shown us everything we need to know, everything we need to believe, and everything we need to do. There's nothing more to say. And yet God keeps speaking through what he has already said. He speaks to me, but he's not telling me it's new. It may be new to me, but he's not telling me anything new. It's just new to me. It's like, a, it's, again, to use one of Tim's, so you're teaching a grandchild how to play a game or do whatever it is. It's all new to him, totally new, right? It's not new. It's just new to him or her. And you get unique opportunities. Yesterday, I went out to the mailbox. Grandkids were over. And one of them was trying to, they're always trying to sneak up on you. They love to freak you out, you know, sneak up, and catch you, you know. So I went out the mailbox and I just turned around. And here he is standing right behind me. He said, did I scare you, Popo? I said, no. I said, I, he said, did you know I was behind you? I said, no. Why would I be scared? I mean, he's like this. And he said, well, Marines aren't afraid of anything, are they? I said, yeah, Marines get scared just like everybody else does. Is how you react to that fear. It's how you respond to the fear. He said, lots of things scare me. I said, the older you get, the less they'll be to scare you. So you get opportunities to just make them understand it's, there's nothing wrong with being afraid. Everybody gets afraid. Everybody gets fearful at times. It's how we respond to that fear, even as little kids. Fear will cause kids to beat each other, and, you know, knock each other around, everything else. It's just, that's what fear does. It brings out the worst in people usually. Amen. So the word of God is living and it's active. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 4.12.
For the word of God is quick, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when you read the word of God, it does that. I mean, we know that it's alive. It's, li it's a living thing. And so it divides. When I read it, and I, I'm in con contradiction to this because I'm in fear or I'm anxious about something or I'm freaking over some other deal, it, it will tell me what is spirit and what's flesh. My flesh is freaking out here, but my spirit knows that God's got this thing under control. It's, it's, under, it's taken care of. It's already finished, right? That's what the Word of God will do. It'll tell you when you're in the flesh. It'll tell you when you're thinking wrong, when you're into fear or you're in distress over something. The Word of God will tell you, hey, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you through the fire. I'll be with you through the flood, he says. You know? So whatever the deal is, he's going to be with us. Even, even if it doesn't look like he's anywhere in sight, like he doesn't even care. He said he'd be with us. He'd never leave us or forsake us. That's the truth. That's what we have to always fall back to. Amen. The reality of what God has said, not what's freaking us. We're not what we're reading in the papers. Not what we're, and there's nothing wrong with knowing what's going on. It's, it'd be foolish to, to ignore it. But make the, make the focus this. Get the information and then come back here to the truth. Amen. To let it settle everything out the way it should be. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, Hebrews 3, verse 7 through 10. Praise God. Hebrews 3, 7 through 10. So wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear His voice. Today. That means right now is always right now. Today. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years... Amen? And still ignored it. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. They'd seen his works, but they didn't understand his ways. They didn't understand that he was not going to do them harm. He's miraculous, but what if he's angry? No, he said, if you'll enter in, I'll take care of it. Right? This is the promised land. But the promised land then was physical territory. The promised land today is Jesus himself. That's what that was pointing to, obviously. Amen? So, Hebrews 3, what, yeah, let, let's go to Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 3 now. And we've looked at these many times, because this is just, a, it's like a, one of the major themes that God's trying to get across to us, I believe, in this last day. Let us therefore fear, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now, all of us have experienced God having done things in our lives. And he said, look, we can be the same as the, as the disciples were. That he just fed 10,000 people or whatever it was, and the next day they're freaking out over a storm. He said, you know, where were you when I was feeding the, the thousands? You know, what, why, why did you forget? Same way with Israel. Took them through the Red Sea. Gave them manna from heaven. Water from a rock. I mean, on and on and on. Come to the promised land and go, oh, wait a minute. There's giants over there. We're not going in there. They, kept, they didn't know the ways of God. They didn't know how to trust God and believe that He only wanted to do good for them, that He only wanted to bless them. It wasn't just about having a miracle take place. It was about provision and protection. Amen? So let us then, so that we don't come short. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. How was the gospel preached unto them? Through the signs Amen. Through the shadows, through the types, and it was all about Jesus. And that's the gospel, is Jesus Christ himself. So unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. We're just resting in God's promise that it is done. I've done it all. It's already finished. Praise the Lord. Amen. So God still speaks. He's not silent. He communicates with us personally and directly. The Holy Spirit takes everything from Christ and gives it to us. There's no new doctrine. We created, man's created all kinds of doctrine, but there's no new doctrine as far as God's concerned. Jesus is the beginning and the end. 
the Alpha, the Omega, the I Am. Amen. That's all you really need to know. That's, that's the only theology we need to share with people. Jesus Christ is Lord and He loves you and He gave Himself for you. And if you'll receive that, if you'll just believe that. Look, they don't have to have an intellectual grasp of this. That's not what faith is about. Because your intellect will argue with you. And so I, God says, it'll divide. This thing will divide between your intellect and your spirit. What is real and what is understandable. They don't have to necessarily understand everything. I think we spend a lot of time trying to get them to be where we are when that revelation has to be unique to them. They have to get that revelation themselves. What we need to do is just share Jesus. Just give them Jesus and the Holy Spirit will take them down that path. Amen? So, hallelujah. Uh, John 16, uh, verses 12 through 15. John 16, 12 through 15. Praise God. We're, we'll be out of here pretty quick. Praise the Lord. So he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot hear them now. See, so that's kind of where we get. He's got a lot more he'd like to share with us, but we've we got to get there. We've got to be the place where we can believe whatever this says. Amen? So how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, the Holy Spirit, right? He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself as if he were a separate entity, but whatsoever he will hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Whatever he heard was what came out of Jesus' mouth, what is now in this Bible. That's what he's going to tell you. That's what he's going to share with us. Amen? Praise the Lord. Uh, Revelation 22, uh, 18 and 19. Revelation 22, 18 through 19. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, he said, I'll take of mine and I'll give it to you. Praise the Lord. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this, uh, the prophecy of this book. We've always said that was the book of Revelation, but he's talking about the entire Bible. If a man shall add anything to these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Verse 20. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Praise the Lord. So, forgive my hiccup there. But uh, regardless, here's what he's saying. Regardless of experience, regardless of the mood, regardless of the culture, regardless of the academics of the day that you happen to live in, the word is the truth. It's the only sure foundation. It's the only absolute that we have. Amen? 2 Peter 1, verses 3 through 4. Second Peter 1, 3 and 4. So according as His divine power... Now just, just think, this, this is such a powerful scripture. According as His divine power hath given unto us. Now, what's His divine power? We read that at the very beginning. It's the word of His power. So, according, you could just say it. According as His divine word has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. What's the divine nature? Faith. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Praise God. He's saying you can be just like God. And the way you do that is by having faith in the word that God has spoken. That's what God did. He said, light be. The word manifested. He believed that it would. And it did. And that's how we are to live our lives the same way. Praise God. So the word of God, it's, it's more than enough. It's... it's Exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. It's more than people uh, need. It's more than what we have to have, even as believers. It's more than what we need to live our lives by these promises. We've got it all right here. All we have to do is look. I got an issue. What's your issue? There's something in here about it. I promise you. And it'll be positive outcome. Amen? The Father's going to speak by means of all that the Spirit has spoken through the Son. The scripture says. So the Father spoke by the Spirit because God is a Spirit. And how did He speak it? By the Holy Spirit through the Son. The Son, it's, it's the same thing that's happening today. God speaks 
His word is there. The Holy Spirit quickens it, brings it to truth in the people who believe. That's why Jesus could say, I and my Father are one. I only say what my Father says because I know anything else is, is co contradicting God's word and it brings negativity. So I only say what he says. I only do what he does. Amen? The Bible, the Bible can no more fail, falter, or be in error than God himself can fail, falter, or be in error. They're one. <laughs> if, if you don't believe everything in here, you don't believe in God. You, 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 you're believing in a religion. You're believing in some religious form. This is God. It's a revelation of God. John 17, uh, verses 16 and through 19. Praise God. John 17, verses 16 through 19. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He's speaking of us as believers. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That means set apart, put into God. You know, the scripture also talks about being, uh, being one with Jesus, or as he is sanctified, so are we sanctified. So sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's what, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth or be in God or be one with God. Amen. So what makes us different? What makes Christians different? It isn't like Don said earlier. It isn't the clothes we wear. It isn't the way we cut our hair or don't cut our hair or it's it's not, you know, uh, rituals. It's, it's none of those things. What sets us apart is that we are protected and provided for and blessed through the truth of God's word. That's what makes us difference. That's the only difference. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Just about to wrap up here. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. All right, verses 20 and 21. Same chapter here in 13. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, here's the bottom line. If Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if Jesus never changed, neither does his word. Neither does his truth, because they cannot be separated. Which means sometimes consistency is the better part of valor. Sometimes it's just dig your heels in. I'm not being budged off of this word. I'm going to believe it. And that's where we're at. Sometimes it's less the hype and the, and the hoopla and more about the just a determination that I'm going to believe this no matter what I'm seeing, no matter what I'm feeling, no matter what I'm hearing, this is the final word. Amen. Amen. It's the truth. Everything else changes. This stuff will change. I guarantee you there will be some other crisis. There will be some other mess. There will be some other man-made or, or demonically inspired situation. The way to come through it is not by trying to get a new uh, shot or a new uh, plan. The way to come through it is to stand on the Word of God, live by that truth, and things have to change. They have to align to this Word. Amen? So since He remains the same, everything in His Word remains the same. Which means we trust the Bible because it's God's Bible. And God being God, we have every reason to take Him at His Word. Last scripture, we'll wrap up. Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. Praise the Lord. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. These are the times that things begin to slip. Pressure, fear, anxiety, stress, worrying, children, grandchildren. What are they going to be faced with? All those kinds of things that go through our minds. Amen. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, 
And every train, you know, angels came and spoke to Daniel. Angels came and spoke to David. You know, and those, those were truth, and they knew it. They fell on their face before him thinking that, that was God. And they'd say, no, don't worship me. I'm an angel. But I'm coming as a messenger of God, right? So if those words spoken by angels were steadfast or, or true, amen, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great sozo, so great salvation, amen, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing witness, bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. That's what we'll see. Amen. Now, we don't need, I don't need a sign. I don't need a miracle to believe this is true. But there are people out there that need signs and wonders and miracles because all they've seen is conflict and, and contradiction within the body of Christ. They need something bigger. Amen. And so we have to be there to let them know what is from God because the enemy will come with lying signs. He's going to come in the last days doing miracles. Amen. Seeming miracles anyway to confuse people. Why? Because that's what they're looking for. That's what will draw them to God. Amen. But they need to see the real thing coming from the people of God and not from some satanically inspired idiot that's just wanting to manipulate and use people. Amen? So there has to be, that's how the very elite, uh, elect, excuse me, would be fooled or, or, or uh, confused. Why? Because they're not standing on this. If you make this the final word, you will not be confused. You will not be tricked. You will not be deceived by the devil. And your stand will have an impact on the unbelievers around you. Amen? Amen? That's what God is calling us to. That's our job. That's always been our job. But now it's, it's become more clear to us what the job might be, that it's not just about me getting a better car, you know, or having a better job. Those things God wants to do for us. I'm not against that. I'm just saying, f for some reason, religion has made it about that. And we've, we've focused more on the gifts than on the giver. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness or his salvation. And all the other stuff gets taken care of. You don't have to focus on it. You just focus on him and he'll meet your needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. Hallelujah. That means health. That means protection. That means prosperity. It means whatever you have need of. Amen. Believe me, when the crap hits the fan, people are looking for somebody who isn't freaking out. They're looking for somebody who, who's calm in that situation, who can say, look, God's on our side. We're going to win this thing. And we're going to win it in a way that nobody can be confused about who the winner is. Amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for your patience. Stand on the word of God and you will be victorious. We are more than conquerors through him. Amen. God bless you. You're all dismissed. Have a great Father's Day.